this uh, topic is, um, right, we're talking tonight about really, this is the, the core issue for us, which is how do children learn about race? And what can we as, their, as the adults in their lives, what can we do to support that learning in a healthy, thoughtful way? Both our guests are experts on that um, and their work um, um, complements right, each other in a way that's super, super useful. Um, Maggie, you want to say what's up, Maggie? Sure, sure. Um, hey, I'm Maggie, and um, I live in Mississippi. Um, my research focuses on white families and white children, and so I've spent a lot of time with kids and with their families and trying to understand um, <clears throat> some of the challenges that their parents face and some of the ways that, that kids are making sense of um, racism and learning racism and learning to challenge racism. Um, and I've always loved Embrace Race since you first got started. And so it's really fun for me, for me to be on here tonight. And actually the other guest, Erin, um, is one of my academic heroes um, and a lot of my research builds on hers. So this is really special for me tonight. So first, we didn't really invite Maggie for her expertise, but just because she loves us. <laughs> uh, what, Who Maggie, <laughs> what Maggie didn't mention is that she recently uh, published a book that's getting a lot of plays called White Kids Growing Up with Privilege in a Racially Divided America, uh, where she explores how white children learn about race in the context of their everyday lives. She's been all over the airwaves and her written work uh, has been all over in some really um, you know, significant venues, The Atlantic, The Guardian, um, the LA Times and more on radio, all of it. Uh, thank you, Maggie, we're really delighted you're here. And Erin, so glad that you're here as well. Um, yeah, we've drawn on Erin's on work uh, a ton. I'm gonna let you say a word about yourself in a second, Erin. Let me just uh, give some of the basics. You are a professor of African and African Diaspora Studies and Urban Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, I think uh, Melissa mentioned uh, <laughs> was here before we started reading Erin's book recently. Uh, the book is called Learning Race, Learning Place, Shaping Racial Identities and Ideas in African-American Childhoods. She recently consulted for the National Museum of African-American History and Culture working to train museum staff to have productive conversations about race and racism with visitors of all ages and backgrounds and many more uh, in, in the case of both of our guests that, we, that could be said, but you get the idea. They're impressive and they're, they're fabulous and reason <laughs> to have them. Erin, did you want to uh, add anything before we dive into uh, what you have to share just for people to know? Sure. Um, like Andrew said, I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I've been in African American studies my whole academic career since I was a freshman. So that's since uh, 25 years. I, <laughs> uh, but I often get the question, you know, how did a white woman like you end up in African American studies? And I go back to my childhood. I grew up in a, a predominantly white college town that like to think of itself as pretty liberal and not having those kinds of problems here. And even my earliest memory as a six-year-old, I mean about this kind of thing, is as a six-year-old wondering, okay, well the adults say everyone is treated equally, but that's not what I see around me. So uh, my interest in this started as a child and I was interested in how do these ideas about race that people have, um, how do they come to be in the first place? And so that's how I got interested in studying how we all develop our ideas about race, our racial identities, and how children, especially for me, African-American children, negotiate racism in their daily lives. Erin, thank you. I'm going to hand it to you, um, I think, to start uh, your presentation. To all right. I just want to note that, um, you know, that point about being six years old, I mean, I think most six-year-olds probably aren't as a uh, um, can't crystallize, right? That I don't know. <laughs> well, no, they know. Right. They know, but perhaps yeah. they wouldn't say, right? Have the wherewithal to say, oh, there's a difference between what I'm seeing and what adults are telling me. But yes, they know. They know. And I'm sure this, you will right. more than touch on that point. We might be raising our kids in that town that she grew up in. Yeah. Anyway. Let's see we'll if I can share. Later. Oops. Nope. That's not what we want to see. Let me try again. Um, let's see if we can get this going right. Let's see, let me try it once more. No, that's not right. Okay, 
once more, sorry, I'll just share my screen. Um, we'll just, uh, That's okay, I can do it. Yeah. Uh, let me share the screen and then get that going. How's that? Perfect. Can you see it? Wonderful. Okay, so thank you so much to all of you for being here tonight. We really appreciate you. I'm super excited to be here with Maggie. I'm so impressed with her work. I love Embrace Race, so just thanks to all of you for being here. We just want to tell you how things will look tonight. We've had the introduction, but then Maggie and I decided that we wanted to structure our time today by interrogating some commonly held myths or misconceptions about how kids learn about race. And so we've broken it down into four main myths. So we're gonna talk about each myth in turn and explain why, although these things seem like they should be true or they seem like common sense, they're actually false. Um, and then we also wanna share with you, um, so given this research, what are some ways in which we can and should be engaging kids about race? And of course, we will also spend most of our time tonight on question and answer. And I think we may um, invert that number three and four a little bit. We'll see how, how our time goes. But, but Maggie and I really wanna focus on these four myths. So Maggie's gonna start it off with our first myth. It's all about what parents say. Right, so this myth um, is one that I often see um, in the aftermath of, for example, a racist hate crime. And I see all kinds of blog posts and, and newspaper articles and op-eds written about how it's really important to talk to your kids about race. And I think that um, while certainly what parents say to their kids about race is meaningful, so too is what they do. And so I think both in my research, but as, as well as Aaron's research, um, you know, we really sort of find that actions speak louder than words. Words. And I think that's a really important um, kind of idea that can debunk this myth. Um, and so in my research on affluent white families, I find that behaviors like um, how to respond when grandpa says something racist at Thanksgiving, right? How parents choose to respond to that um, is a way in which they're modeling behavior to their kids. And so that, you know, that action is really powerful, what they do or what they don't do. And even silence can be a form of modeling. Um, in addition, um, choosing neighborhoods, um, where you live, where your kids go to school, the friendship groups that you either encourage or even discourage, um, the extracurricular activities that you enroll your children in, um, and so forth. These, these things um, I show in my book and in my research, and, and again, building on Erin's amazing research, um, really um, you know, speak to how a child's racial context is set up. Um, and I think Erin's gonna talk a little bit more about this in a moment. Um, but I do think that, um, at least when it comes to white parents, um, you know, for example, when, when white parents are consistently hoarding opportunities for their own children through the choices that they make about, for example, schools, then, um, and they fail to see that this is connected in some way to racial power and to the perpetuation of racial inequality, um, then, then, you're really, then I think you can really see how even though parents might say one thing about what they think about race, their actions are actually conveying something very different. And, it put, and in my book, I show how sometimes says even, you know, their, their behaviors are actually counter counteracting or contradicting what they say that they believe. Um, and this, you know, again, actions speak louder than words. Okay, so our second myth we want to talk about is that families control what their kids learn. So I don't know if you all have experienced this as parents or families of kids, but usually if there's sort of a racialized behavior or comment on a child's part, immediately the blame goes to the family, that it must have been the family that gave the child this idea. And so this is a, a, a myth that we want to debunk. Now certainly families play a big role and parents may wish to limit their children's exposure to racism or they may wish to avoid having discussions about race but the truth is that children live in the same racialized society that all of us live in and they are getting messages from all around them every day. So often I will, in my work, parents will say to me like, gosh, I, my kid is only three, they're only four, they're too young to talk to them about this, they don't notice it yet. Um, but what research shows us is, you know, kids are noticing 
racialized patterns in the world around them. And they are trying to figure out those patterns. So those messages are getting to them from a whole variety of sources, not just from families. So they are really actively processing messages and negotiating messages that they're getting from a whole variety of sources. So media is one that comes to mind, books, cartoons, and so on and so forth, toys. Now, maybe you'll say, well, I don't let my kids watch TV. I don't let my kids watch Disney movies. So media isn't, isn't getting into my kids. But when your kids go and play with other kids, they might see that um, Elsa princess on the t-shirt or the backpack or the toy or on the sleeping bag at the sleepover. So, you know, even if you try to limit your child's exposure to some of these things, those messages are really getting in from these other sources. Um, or let's say that you protect your child um, from discussions around race and racism, but they go to a school or a daycare um, or the doctor's office or the grocery store. And they see there who seems to have what kinds of jobs. Are there any racialized patterns in the power hierarchy? Now your three-year-old isn't saying, are there any racialized patterns in the power hierarchy? But they are noticing patterns. Who seems to have what kinds of jobs? Who seems to be the most popular princess? Um, and so they are getting those messages from the world around them. And uh, both Maggie and I in our research do a lot around place, how place itself really sends messages to kids about who belongs where, who gets what kinds of houses or who gets what kinds of stuff. And so even if they ride or walk through um, neighborhoods in your area or your city, um, they, are, they are getting messages about patterns that they see that seem to um, um, revolve around skin color or race. And then they also, if they go to museums or other kinds of extra, extracurricular activities, they're getting ideas about who belongs where, but also about whose ideas or artworks or discovery um, or contributions are really being held up as most important or worthy of recognition. And so from all of this, they're picking up on patterns. We shouldn't be surprised that young kids were teaching them to recognize patterns. They're, we want them to match their shapes and their animals and you know match things and learn patterns. Um, but they're trying to figure out the rules from those patterns that they see around them. So families often think that they alone control um, what children learn but these messages come from all over. Now that doesn't mean that families don't play a role. Families can help their children process and critique the racialized messages that they're getting from all of these places. But we often think we're protecting children um, by uh, avoiding talking to them about race or exposing them to certain things. But when we do this, what we're actually doing, if we're silent about race, is we're letting racialized messages from society seep in and become ingrained. So they see those patterns. And if we don't help them understand why those patterns exist and that those patterns aren't earned or justified, they tend to think of them as rules and rules that are caused by inherent differences between people. And this is what our research shows, that these ideas are ingrained by about three years old, three to four years old. Um, so children are internalizing messages from the world around them by the time they're in preschool. But adults can help disrupt this process, and we will talk a little bit more about that um, in your question and answer time. So I'm going to do myth number three, and then you'll hear back from Maggie again for myth number four. So myth number three is that this is something that just happens to kids. It just happens to kids. So uh, in actuality, what's going on is that children are really active in this process. They are actively negotiating messages from a variety of sources. Often children are thought of as empty vessels um, or blank slates into which adults or other sources are just pouring ideas or you know, onto which adults are inscribing ideas. Um, but instead, our research shows that children are not at all passive in this process, but they're actively negotiating the messages that they receive. 
So when I first started researching this topic, all of the scholarly literature I was coming across was talking about children being socialized or being racially socialized or parents socializing their children. So parents were um, conceived of as active in this process, but children were really um, framed as passive. Um, but also what was happening was um, that the focus seemed to me in the research to be on the sources of the messages. The research was concerned with the parents or the media or the schools, the sources of the message, but no one seemed to really be centering on the children and how they were negotiating all of these messages and actively deciding, you know, how to interpret these messages. And so that's why I created this framework called Comprehensive Racial Learning, because I wanted to do first thing. Um, two things. First, I wanted to um, sort of deal with what we talked about just in myth number two, that notion that it's only parents. And I wanted to instead say, like, actually, it's a variety of sources that are involved in this process with kids from which children are receiving messages. But second, I really wanted to center children and say, you know, children are at the center of this process and they are very active in this process. So instead of being socialized, they are learning, they're engaging in a learning process. And so let's think about how they receive these messages. How do they make decisions about how to interpret these messages and what to filter out or reject or keep and so on, or modify, however they're sort of in, involved in this negotiating these messages. So racial learning is really an active process. Kids are actively participating in this. And this also means that children don't always interpret messages the way that adults intend. So for example, many parents will, will send colorblind messages, like um, we don't notice color because we're all the same on the inside. The parents' intent in this is, to, is a really an egalitarian message, that everyone is equal. But research shows, perhaps counterintuitively, that these colorblind messages increase racial bias in children. Um, because what happens is the takeaway message for them is they see racialized inequities in the world around them, like we've discussed, they see racial patterns. But if they're told everyone's the same, then they often interpret these racial patterns not as unfairness, but as something that's been earned or something that's deserved or justified. So in fact, colorblind language increases racial prejudice in children. Now for my research with African American children in Detroit, I have tons and tons of examples of uh, families thinking they're sending one kind of message and children interpreting another. But I'm just gonna share one with you here, just a brief one here. So here's a quote from a 13 year old um, in Detroit, Michigan. And she says, um, she's asked if, if the adults in her life talk to her about race. And she says, in a way they do, because my grandma had adopted some foster kids and they was white, but they wanted to be black. My grandma was telling them how, if you want to be black men, then some black men don't get everything that a white man gets. But my grandma said, if you have a chance to pick if you was white or black, to go white, because white people have special just access to stuff. But I really didn't understand what she was saying. But I do, I do, but I don't. Because to me, she will say stuff like, you should be proud to be black. So I'm like, okay. So here's an example where the grandmother intends to send some important messages and some common racial socialization messages. One is about how white privilege functions in society. And the second is about the importance of having black pride. And yet here we see her granddaughter isn't just an empty vessel or a sponge soaking up the message exactly how grandma intends. Instead, she's interpreting it in relationship to other and other messages she's received, other experiences she's had across time and place. So I'm sure Maggie and I both have lots of examples of this, but the basic idea is kids are not blank slates or empty vessels here. They're actively interpreting the messages they receive. Okay.
Right, and so um, the fourth myth that Erin and I came up with is this notion that families of color have this figured out. And so um, one of the things that I think um, certainly I've noticed in talking to white parents, and in fact, when I was trying to recruit participants for my book, um, I would ask white parents to participate and they would refer me to their black friend or their black neighbor. And they would say, oh, well, they, they know all about how to do this, so you should go talk to them. Um, which, you know, is interesting that, you know, the kind of an indication that white people don't think that they have race sometimes. Um, but I think that the, the message here is this idea, this myth that somehow magically people raising black and brown children somehow have this figured out. And so um, I think that before I go deeper into this, um, I think it's really important to say from the, from the very beginning that of course, given the racialized nature of our society and you know I'm a sociologist so thinking about hierarchies and power and history and all of that it's very clear that families of color face an unfair and unjust burden um, you know raising children in america and they have to make difficult choices um, for sure and so um, i think aaron sort of alluded to some of the um, you know, some of the challenges, including that example with the grandmother that she just read. Um, but, you know, thinking about how to talk to your kids about things like anti-blackness and about racism and about racial violence and about current events. And, and you know, how do you have those conversations? And so um, what the research shows, and I, and I should say that this is a really, um, it's an area that's really growing, both in fields like human development and family studies, but also in sociology and, and a number of other fields as well. Um, but what we, what we see across a range of different studies, and I also should add that although I study white families and although Erin has studied African-American families, um, certainly this is not just a white family, black family situation. Um, and, and in fact, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of research that's emerging um, and really has been over the past few decades that's looking at Latinx families, Asian American families, mixed race families, biracial families. And so um, certainly tonight, we don't want to paint the picture that this is just about white families and black families. Obviously, that, that's not true. Um, so we don't mean to structure this as only an issue that, affect, that affects black and white um, children and families. So what we do know from the research, though, is that um, there is no uniform approach. So when we look at the scholarship, and there's some really great sort of reviews of the literature by, um, there's one by Diane Hughes, for example, who's a psychologist. And, um, you know, she really sort of shows how across a range of different studies, we see that there's no uniform approach in families of color, and in particular in African American families, um, which is where a lot of this research, you know, initially emerged for really important reasons. Um, and so, you know, this is where this, this, this question of how to make choices and decisions about approaching this process come into play. Um, and, you know, I think it's, um, you know, I, I talk to my students sometimes about, about racial socialization and what they remember, or comprehensive racial learning. Um, and oftentimes they, you know, they will talk about how, you know, especially if they're, you know, themselves a person of color, you know, the fears that they have thinking ahead into their future about how they will raise children in America. And so I think, you know, this myth that somehow magically families of color have this figured out um, is, is absolutely um, misleading. Um, and so I think that one of the, the really powerful lessons from Erin's research, as well as some others, is that context, context really matters. Um, and that, you know, thinking about where families are living, thinking about local dynamics, thinking about current events, thinking about the racial and political landscape of communities. I mean, I think all of these things are really important. Um, and I don't, I, I don't think that there's any, you know, clear direction. I know we might talk about, you know, some tips that we have, but I think that, um, you know, this is a really complicated and messy you know, thing that, you know, that we're, that we're, that we're talking about. Um, but certainly the research shows that there, you know, there is, there's not just one way, to, there's not just one way um, that, that families of color approaches. I should add also that there are some patterns, like we, that we know patterns about age, for example, like parents tend to talk to kids about different things, different ages, um, or tend to not talk about things at different ages. Um, and then there's also patterns around, you know, teaching racial pride or maybe even teaching colorblindness, um, kind of as Erin alluded to. So again, a range of, a range of different approaches, but that's sort of the point, right? That it's not just this one thing and, um, and it's, you know, and it's clear. So that's, I think, the fourth myth. So I didn't know, Andrew, Melissa, do you want to go to questions now? Yes, no, thank you both for that. Lots of excellent information there. Um, I, we do want to go to questions. We already have quite a few.
in Q&A. Again, folks, if you'd like to uh, add some more, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, we won't get to all of them, to, yeah. to be clear, but um, we'll we will to certainly get to some good to ones. We'll try to connect resources as we can, yeah. Before going to, um, before selecting from the questions we've gone, I did want to follow up on a thing that uh, you, Aaron, uh, said in particular, um, because it does have to do with right, what we know and how we know it. And what you said was that, you know, by age three, racial attitudes are ingrained, right? So like value-driven racial attitudes. Um, I think you used the word ingrained, but whatever the right word is, can you just say more about you know, what is happening, you know, roughly around age three? Right. So I don't want to make it sound like it's uh, permanent and can never change. But what the research really reflects very consistently is that by age three, children are showing a pro-white bias. So we see around age two and a half, we see in research with toddlers that toddlers of different or preschoolers, toddlers of different um, races show what we would call an in-group bias. So there's some things going on internally, cognitively with their thinking um, that sort of um, makes them tend towards an in-group bias. And the studies that look at this look at things like um, how children pick a potential new playmate. So showing them photos of kids that they don't know um, of their race and of, a diff of different races. And younger kids tend to choose a, 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 of, a, of a, someone they don't know, they tend to choose a same race playmate. But by many of these studies show that by three or four, um, the white kids continue to choose a white same race playmate, but the um, children of color start also choosing a potential white playmate. So instead of like this sort of in-group bias thing, we start seeing all of the kids shifting towards a pro-white bias. And so what researchers think is going on is that those messages from the world around them are getting in that, you know, uh, it's better to be white, the hero's always white, white people get nicer stuff, you know, these kinds of messages are coming in from the world around them. Now, adults often think that um, three-year-olds are too young to talk to about these things, but when we don't talk to them about it, they see those patterns in the world around them, and they internalize them as um, deserved or earned or justified. And so in fact, when we use colorblind language or silence with kids that young, we actually sort of give up our power to the messages coming from society. And so this is why I really try to encourage parents and we can talk about some ways, how do you talk to a three or four year old about the patterns that they're seeing in a way that they're able to um, question them and critique them. Did that answer your question, Andrew? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, and that does that does uh, remind me of um, Michelle Wallace, who wrote uh, uh, Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman all those years ago. She wrote this article and talked about the doll test, you know, yeah. and about how uh, black and white children were favoring white dolls. And her response to that was, well, they know the right answer. You know, mm. not, it's not necessarily that, oh, I, I think I'm bad, but I know how I'm being viewed in this con. Like I know what the interviewer wants to know, right? Mm -hmm. Or is asking, if that makes sense. There's a little bit of a difference there between, oh, I think this and, oh, I am in this world and I'm navigating it, you know? So I think a lot of, we got a question actually from a parent whose child, uh, biracial child was identifying as white and is sort of light skinned, but seemed to have a preference and I don't know how old the child was, but they were talking about a wrinkle in time and how they preferred, I don't know, they, pre they so they were of an age to watch that. So let's say eight, 10. And the parents were upset, you know, just why is my child favoring? And I, I kind of think there's a bit of that, um, they know the right answer, right? So how do we interrupt that? And, and what would you say to either of you to that parent? I mean, sort of extending from what you just said. I don't know if you're familiar at all with the research of Carrie Ann Rockymore. Um, she and her co-author, I know the last name is Laz Laffey. I don't know the, her first name, I apologize, but they have a book called Raising Biracial Children. And in that they have a model they call the Kogi model, the continuum of biracial identity. And they make the argument that they're talking specifically about biracial children who have a black parent and a white parent. Um, and they make the argument that um, 
a child could have a healthy biracial identity that leaned more white or leaned more African American, um, or even where they identified exclusively as one or the other, um, as long as they came to it from a healthy place of not denying one side or the other. So that might be a book. I mean, I don't, I can't go into all the specifics here, but that might be a. Um, that might be an interesting book to read or argument to engage where they say it's less about the identity that's ended up upon and more about um, the process to get there and whether or not it involves sort of denial um, of one side or the other. But I think what I, what I hear you saying, Melissa, is that you're sort of reflecting on the fact that, okay, well, what do we expect if children are raised in a society that is continually um, privileging whiteness? in all different realms. And we've named a few, but there are many different realms. And it's constantly sending this message that, um, you know, whiteness is better in many different ways, or that it's easier to be white or better to be white or all these different things, then should we be surprised when children choose the white doll? Or should we be surprised when children choose the white heroine um, in the film or those kinds of things um, because they're getting those messages and it's unhealthy for all kids but I can see how you know it's, it feels especially unhealthy for parents of color and this is why it's because those ideas are getting in so early we think three is too young to talk with kids about this but that's when we know that these ideas are reflected in their choices and so this is why we have to recognize, even if we think we're protecting them, they see patterns in the world around them. And we have to explain to them that those patterns are because of unfairness. They're not because of um, inherent you know, differences or earned or justified differences. They're because of unfairness. And they're because of social unfairness. The good thing here is that if you spend any time with kids, you know that they are very into what is fair and what is not fair, right? If there's one thing kids have, it's a very keen sense of justice. So we can use this notion about um, fairness to help them understand these patterns that they're seeing. Usually the question that I get is sort of like, how do you explain this? in age appropriate ways. Um, and that, you know, depends on the age of the child, but there's age appropriate ways for three year olds, four year olds, eight year olds, you know, 13 year olds to talk about the unfairness in the world around them. And that helps them critique instead of subconsciously internalizing those messages um, that they're bombarded with over and over, both obvious and subtle about whiteness being better. Um, instead, you're teaching them to recognize those as false messages based around unfairness and to critique them. And soon they're able to do that on their own. Now, one thing, and then I promise I'll stop talking, is you don't wanna teach kids, it's not responsible for us to teach kids about fairness, unfairness, excuse me, without also empowering them and showing them that there are people working to make change and that they can be part of that change. Because otherwise you're essentially saying, and this can be really damaging, especially to children of color, sorry, life is totally unfair to people of color. Okay, sleep tight. You know, that's, that's going to be scary um, and just really demoralizing. And so that's why we always, um, um, always, always, always teach about unfairness, but link it to empowerment. So I can go, I don't want to go on and on, but that's something that we can talk more about. So thank you, Erin. Um, you know, Maggie, I want to take this next one to you. Uh, because actually it's a it's a case in point right of a child recognizing patterns um and but it's a and but you know we have a specific age for the child in a specific situation um and i want to offer one little twist i'll read this and offer a little twist which is it's not clear here uh, what the racial identity of the child is uh, so i'm wondering if you know from your perspective if that makes a difference in exactly how you uh, frame the answer and the, the question is this uh, this is from Sasha, who says, my nearly six-year-old daughter recently commented about how back in the 60s, brown-skinned people had to sit in the back of the bus, but she's noticed that nowadays it's mostly brown-skinned people that drive the bus. She acknowledged that it's been a while since she last rode a city bus. I affirmed her comment, but how could I help her further process the facts of what she was noticing and reflecting on? Again, what, what's your basic answer to that? And does it matter uh, the racial identity of the child in this case, what you would say, or how does it matter? 
Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and it's interesting that this is that this is an example that, that came, um, you know, from a, from a family because actually in my book, there are this similar types of things emerge, particularly with this idea of, of buses um, and then particularly thinking about um, segregation, uh, both segregation, for, you know, formal segregation of the past, but also patterns today that this child is noticing with who drives the bus. Um, so I think that from a racial learning perspective, I think that regardless of the racial identity of the child, they're noticing patterns as they go about their everyday life, you know, everyday life. Um, but I do think that, you know, I, I never want to center whiteness in a way or, or assume that, you know, a white child noticing that is the same as a, as a black child noticing that, just given the history and the perpetuation of anti-blackness in America. And so I, I think that it's important to acknowledge that reality. Um, but in terms of the process of learning, I think that, you know, it's about noticing patterns like Aaron was explaining. And, um, you know, based on my research, you know, I did this ethnographic study with 30 families, but even one of them, these are all white families, but, you know, at least in a couple of those families, a very similar, I observed a very similar thing happen. Um, and, I, and I also observed parents respond to that in different ways. And so, um, in fact, in the very beginning of my book, so I think one of the very first quotes from a, from a child, she confuses um, Rosa Parks with Eleanor Roosevelt. And she talks about how Eleanor Roosevelt sat in the back of the bus and she was African-American and everything's good now, but it used to be really bad. Um, and I think, and you know, as she said that to me, her mother sat by and listened and nodded her head and affirmed her daughter and never corrected her or provided any context. Um, and there was another mother that similarly used the film The Help, which, you know, historians have talked a lot about how problematic that film is. Um, you know, it's not a film that you should use to teach your children about, you know, domestic work in the, in the South during Jim Crow. I mean, that's, that's just not what you should do. Um, but, you know, she was drawing on that as, as a tool to guide her children's understanding of, um, you know, the, the history of racism in America. And so I think what I would say is in terms of the best um, way to handle that is to affirm the child's, you know, experience and what they're noticing. And I'm really big on listening to kids and trying to understand where they're coming from and why they're noticing things and what they're, how they're thinking of that. So maybe some follow-up questions about, well, can you want to talk about that a little bit more? Like, you know, what, what you think that means? Why do you think this is true? Um, and then I think really educating yourself as an adult, but then as, and as a parent, um, and being able to provide children with that history so that they understand the history that came before today. Um, I think that too often, you know, people don't want to talk to their kids about history. And then that means that their children, like, like why else, you know, their children are not going to, to reach any other conclusion um, sometimes than than ones that, that we might identify as racist because they don't know the history that's come before. And so um, I really think that it's important. And I noticed with the white children that I worked with that those that had a, a better grasp on the multicultural history of America and the history of white supremacy in America were much more, uh, they had the tools to then cr um, be more critical in, in, in the moment of today. So that I could, again, go on and on about that. But it is interesting that that, that exact, um, you know, experience, that, 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 that was what the, the mom was talking about um, here in this Q&A, because that's something that I noticed in my own research, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're pinned the headline. Um, so, thank yeah, thank you. Um, David asks, um, can you reflect on the, the pluses and minuses of putting students into a racially diverse school when many schools are uh, systemically racist towards people of color? Um, witnessing the systemic racism versus the importance of being in a diverse environment six to seven hours a day. So I know you guys worked in, I mean, your research is mostly in pretty segregated um, communities. So I don't know how you'd respond to this and if you want to take it. And did, I'm sorry, can you remind me, did David say, did David specify race of child or no? No, it seems, uh, it, I, I think people, uh, a child of color, but not specific, more specific than that. I mean, this is, you know, it's interesting. I'm sure, I'm sure folks have seen that there's been a lot of news stories lately about African American families in particular choosing to homeschool um, for not the same reasons that traditionally families have chosen to homeschool, but more to sort of deal with um, systemic racism in schools in the form of disproportionate discipline and suspension and expulsion starting 
at preschool age or um, a Eurocentric curriculum or implicit bias in, in teachers or, you know, all these different kinds of things. Um, there has been some movement of saying, you know, why are we subjecting our, our children to this? So I hear a little bit maybe of that in David's question, you know, is it better for a child to get this kind of experience in an integrating, in an integrated setting because those are the kinds of um, things that they will have to be negotiating in their adult life, most likely, or is it better to, um, um, you know, not subject them to that kind of Eurocentric environment that's not going to fully value them and their intelligence and, you know, ha has bias and standardized tests and yeah, um, in racialized tracking and all different kinds of things. Am I interpreting the, the question correctly there? Um, so, I mean, I think that's something that uh, each parent has to decide. I will say in my own research in Detroit, parents had different points of view about this. Um, both parents, all parents in the study thought that raising their children in Detroit, which was at the time 86% African American and still is, you know, the, the, the major city in the U.S. with the highest proportion African American population by far. Um, I think, you know, comparable New Orleans or, or you know, D.C. are around 66%, Detroit's more around 86%. All those parents thought that, you know, the fact that their kids were inherently going, being raised in a predominantly black city where the mayor was black, the police chief was black, the school superintendent was black, most of their teachers were black, was really, you know, sending their children a message about that normalized blackness and black culture um, and black experiences um, in, in a particular way that was unique, they felt within large cities within the United States. But parents had different views about whether this was protective or about whether it was like basically playing a mean joke on their kids. So some parents thought, look, this is a gift I'm giving my child. They don't have to explain who they are. They don't have to deal with teachers who think they're less than and so on and so forth. Um, they see, you know, one quote from a mother named Audrey was something about, you know, they see their people moving around and doing it for themselves. But a whole nother set of parents thought, okay, it might be protective for now, but eventually it's going to hurt them. Because one, as one mother said, this isn't real life. Real life isn't like Detroit. Um, so I think that's, again, an example of what Maggie was saying about, about sort of unfair burden um, placed on parents of color. They're between a rock and a hard place. Which choice do I make for my child? Um, which, you know, neither is a perfect sort of choice. So which choice do I make for my child? So I'm afraid I'm not sure I answered that um, with a, in a concrete way. You should do this versus this, um, but more sort of thinking about... Um, the factors that go into that kind of decision. Yeah, no, this is great. And I want to come back to, um, you know, as we said at the very beginning. Well, I just want to ask Erin to stop screen share just for a Yes, minute. of course. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I totally forget. And then we're like this in the recording. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> One of the points that you made in the presentation was that, right, racial, the racial context, the racial environment includes much more, of course, than what parents say or, or simply things that are said. And one of the things I wanted to dig in on a little bit more and, and uh, maybe go to you, Maggie, is this issue of modeling, right? So adults and parents in particular modeling for small children and we've touched on this already, but I wonder if you could say a bit more about what that might look like or the sorts of things we as, as adults in the lives of children need to think about when we think about modeling. And, and especially since you worked with um, white families, you said 30 families, right, and uh, affluent families, I believe, you know, what, can you give some maybe real examples of things that, you know, some of them, the more thoughtful, deliberate um, of those families, uh, the, the adults in those families, some of the choices they made that resulted in good modeling for their children? Absolutely. So um, the children that I interviewed and that I, and I spent two years with these families, they were all in middle schools. They were between the ages of like 10 and 13. Um, and so <clears throat> I noticed all kinds of things when they were um, that age. But then I also went back and re-interviewed a subset of that sample when they were in high school. And so I was able to sort of see them in a little bit, you know, they're a little older. Um, and certainly they were more confident in their 
positions and their sort of racial views. There was a lot of things that happened in the United States during their childhoods with, with respect to race, um, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and so what I thought was particularly striking, and I, I promise this is answering your question, um, is that for the, the kids who were living in a more integrated and meaningfully integrated with equal status contact, and there's all kinds of um, things here, that when they were living in that context, then when they were a little bit older and they were confronted with, for example, police violence, um, there was a, a tragedy in this community where, where a police officer killed a black boy, a black teenager. Um, and that, like, it was really interesting to see how these white, these white kids from this more integrated space as a result in part of their parents modeling this kind of behavior um, were much more um, critical about what was happening. They not only did they participate in some of the anti-racist organizing, but what I thought was particularly thoughtful was the way that they took a back seat, um, and they were thoughtful in with respect to like not trying to dominate, you know, not trying to take over the way that we you know, um, you know, white parents often do with PTAs. There's some great research by Lynn Posey Maddox on that. Um, but really, I thought that these that these young people were noticing that, hey, you know, I want to go to the march, but I'm not going to walk in the front. I'm going to be there to support my, my peers. And um, and so I think that that, that that's one example. Um, and I think that if I look back to that, to those children that are they're teenagers at this point, um, were teenagers at that point, um, if I go back and look, there was a lot of that, hap a lot of modeling of that kind of um, that kind of work, anti-racist work, if you want to call it that, or just sort of listening to people of color, um, having, again, meaningful equal status relationships, not relationships where you have all the power as the white person, but really meaningful relationships and, um, you know, among many other things. And I'm not saying that any one of the, the families was doing everything right. I'm not sure what that would even really mean. Um, certainly there are all kinds of moments where white parents were undermining their efforts, you know, in different ways. Um, but I think that that's one concrete example of the importance of parents understanding that when your children are younger, they're beginning to develop these things that I think in my research really documents take hold and become even, um, I think, a larger part of their racial ideology or the way that they, their, their sort of belief system about how the world works that, that become, as we know, much more difficult to change when, for example, they're in college. Um, there's some great research by some of my colleagues that look at college students and, you know, how difficult it is to get particularly white students to think differently about race. Um, and I think that this whole topic of, of white racial socialization is really important to think about. Um, more clearly and, and th to think about how modeling is part of that. So to, to, to both of you or either of you, sort of this, this issue, um, right? So, you know, Erin, you explained um, more fully you know, what's happening in right, the toddler brain, mm -hmm. right? And how uh, essentially these attitudes, you know, get some purchase, uh, at, you know, around age three in a way that's not true at age one, let's say. Um, and then, you know, Maggie, you just said, yeah, by college, Right, these are more ingrained. Again, not you know that they're unchangeable. Um, lots of us had uh, you know have had scales fall from our eyes after college, happily uh, in many arenas. But I'm wondering that's what we college professors have to hope anyway. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what you're about, right? Um, so I'm wondering between age three and age you know 23, um, can can what can you say about yeah, the, um, how changeable we are, how persuadable we are, you know, is there between those ages a time when, well, this is, you know, of course we should be doing this work routinely, right? But, but here's when things really start to harden, you know, and here's where no really kids are remarkably open. You know, you know what I'm saying? Do we know anything about what's happening in that long range? Sure. I mean, I don't want to get too wonky on you and, and go into, stages of child development and things like that. But what, one thing I do want to say is, you know, adults can change their implicit bias, but you have to want to do it. So I think the research that Maggie's talking about is a lot of what's difficult to change is getting student, getting adults to want to do this so much they will commit to the, you know, you, you have to be very conscious about working to change implicit bias. You have to want to do it. You have to recognize it. You have to regularly work on, um, you know, counter stereotypic imaging and imagining yourself as a member of a stereotype group and all these sort of specific behaviors. And it's just like, um, any any 
any kind of uh, change that requires a regular daily practice, we may wish to meditate every day, but, or we may wish to exercise every day, but do we do the work? And it's actually the same with changing um, implicit biases. And so first you have to want to do it and then you have to put in the work. So um, it's possible to change. I don't want anyone to feel like, well, my kid is 13, so forget it. It's already ingrained. It's too late. No, it's possible for any of us to change. But what does and why I really encourage um, parents of young children to start early is, you know, we're getting primed from birth with these racialized messages and they're sinking into our um, subconscious very early. And so we have evidence even um, with uh, six month olds, actually three months old, that they can categorize non-verbally based on race, based on how long they gaze at new faces of, of the same race as their primary caregiver versus different race than their primary caregiver. So kids are categorizing. By two, we see them using race to reason about things. So in stories, why did that person do that? Maybe it was because his skin was brown, but we don't see it reflecting the um, prejudice or in-group bias in the same way. And then it's three where it's really, really showing that sort of bias. But we're seeing the categorization and the reasoning even earlier than we're seeing that, um, that bias, that pro-white bias. Um, one thing that changes um, when kids get to be around seven or eight is actually, um, in, in these are experiments that are around resource distribution. So if you ask kids to, you know, decide who's going to get the toys or the new playground equipment or whatever, five and six-year-olds will um, show in-group bias, you know, or show a pro-white bias, and they'll say they should get it because they're white, uh, for example. Um, seven or eight and nine, 10 year olds in the same experiments, they will make the same biased decision, but they have now learned that you're not supposed to say. So their bias is becoming more implicit. And so they will say things like, oh, well, these people should get it because they worked harder or these people should get it because they're more deserving. So we see the ideas um, becoming more implicit around age eight. And so that's why I'm really, really urging parents to try to, before it gets so implicit, when kids are still willing to talk about their reasoning, that's when you can really sort of help disrupt. Now you can help disrupt it later, but at that point it's become a little bit more subconscious. Right, so we should, um, we're getting close to wrap up time and we have so many questions. Um, so I'd love to get all of those sites to everything that you guys are talking about, but, uh, and pass them on to these folks. Um, but I'm, there's a question here from, um, that I just, that relates to your kind of what can we do and what you guys are getting to about um, empowerment. Uh, can you say more about how exactly to link empowerment when we're teaching kids about unfairness? And, and I, I want to, Sort of unpack it a little bit more um, and you know we, we think a lot in this work about empowerment being sort of um, cultural empowerment uh, you know uh, lots of um, maybe specifically sort of where did your, your where did your family come from um, you know how did they get to where they they got uh, lots of great uh, examples of um, people doing good and doing well um, where you can and, and getting somewhere from nowhere, you know? Um, so all of that kind of- The resilience of a family characteristic, right? Yeah. And community characteristic. So, so I think of that as sort of the empowerment stuff and having lots of images and the media and all of that and exposure, 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 right? Um, but I think parents have a hard time when they, um, you were telling us a bit about when people actually talk um, to their kids about um, about race, how are they talking to their kids about race, right? So we do the sort of empowerment and the preparation for bias, you know, mm -hmm. as a sort of mm -hmm. psychologist, as I like to call it. Um, and that's, it's unfair, just taking apart the power structures because they're seeing it, right? So we do both of those, but what are par parents of color actually doing and what are white parents actually doing when if they talk about race at all? Maggie, can I jump in? And then, yes, please. Okay, so um, let me give an example of sort of pairing, um, appealing to kids' sense of fairness with empowerment. And I'm just gonna be really quick, um, but um, here in Milwaukee, um, and I'm sure we're not the only place, there's a major east-west thoroughfare called North Ave. 
and it starts all the way on Lake Michigan. And you can imagine the homes on Lake Michigan are very lovely and fancy. And there's a big, fancy, shiny Whole Foods all the way on the east end of North Ave. And then if you take North Ave West all the way out to the suburbs, you drive through uh, overwhelmingly black um, neighborhood that looks quite different than this sort of fancy, overwhelmingly white east side neighborhood. So I'm just going to give an example of a of um, you know a, a parent of a four year old driving the length of North Ave and noticing the child saying like where's the Whole Foods for the brown people. So sort of noticing a difference, for example, in so so here's an example where um, it's important to talk to the child about you know, is it fair that there is access to sort of healthy, fresh, you know, fancy, nice groceries um, where white people live and not where in this case where African American people live? Of course, the child doesn't think that's fair. They don't think it's fair at all. But you don't just want to say like, well, that's how it is, right? We do want to say sometimes our, it's, things are not fair for people of color simply because they're people of color. And that's wrong. That's wrong and it's morally unjust and it's something that you know, we need to all work on together. But you don't wanna just leave it there for children, especially for children of color. That's gonna be very um, disheartening to say the least. And so here's an example where it's important to pair that right up, especially for a young child with something concrete that they can feel, see not abstract, but they can witness and be part of. So for example, here in Milwaukee, we have lots of urban agriculture, urban, you know, fisheries and people who are working to say like, this is um, an issue of racial justice. And so she could say, you know, um, here's people in our community that you can meet who are working on this. And guess what? They are saying that we can come and help them water the lettuce and we can come and you know, help them be, you know, so this is something showing kids that there is unfairness, but people are working to do something about it. And I'll link, maybe we can link to um, uh, an exercise that I call the spider web activity that you can do with little kids, where you help explain institutional racism to them by saying that it's something that's gotten tangled up for a long time. Unfairness is really tangled up from even before mom was born. And even before grandma was born, they, that blows their minds. That was like ancient history to them. And you can say, you learned that Rosa Parks helped doing some, help, help untangle some unfairness. And you learned that Martin Luther King helped untangle some unfairness. Here are people in our community who are untangling unfairness. And all of us have to work to untangle that unfairness because it's gotten really tangled up. No, thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Our time is at an end. I wanted to, we wanted to close though by making sure we spelled out for you the uh, six um, suggestions that oh. Erin and Maggie had for uh, engaging with children on, uh, on this topic of race and racism. Yeah. Um, now I have it in front, I can, I can just okay. read it. Um, and we will share more resources. So, right, so get comfortable talking about race, racism and racial inequality normalize talking about it, right? Avoid silence, make it routine, empower, as uh, we've talked about, modeling behavior for children, as we've talked about, connecting the past with the present and teaching critical race theory. And the, literacy. Um, sorry, race, race literacy, <laughs> critical race theory is in my own past. Um, <laughs> and then finally listening to children, right? Listening to them, understand their questions. Get on the floor. Yeah, where are they going Elaborate, go? talk about yeah, it. Yeah, this is, there's so much we could go on and on. And so we will definitely um, make these resources available for folks on this. Um, we'll put them on our website, but this video will go up tomorrow and then the additional stuff and a transcript uh, the week after, sometimes a little bit longer than that, depending. But um, there are so many questions and in the, in the, in there's, I really encourage you guys to um, look into these folks and we'll send you their bios as well and their books and to look at our archive because it's pretty deep there are a lot of questions that we've um, sort of talked about before and had longer discussions about so uh, we're trying to do uh, exactly what Erin and Maggie were suggested suggesting which is to change our practice as parents and caregivers of children by just constantly working on it so that's part of what the monthly conversation is and um, other programming that we're working on. So I hope you you join us um, in the future. And everyone, uh, first, everyone who tuned in, thank you for being part of our record 
uh, setting uh, audience, uh, both live and uh, in registration. And Maggie and Aaron, thank you so much for the phenomenal work you've both done, work which is actively reshaping right this conversation about how we help our kids learn about race in a really thoughtful and constructive direction, which we obviously desperately need yeah. in this country. So yeah, thank you, really thank, thank you. Thank you for your work, yeah. And we, um, we have lots of different folks on all the time and we love, um, yeah, we, we love white people doing the work as well. I just wanna say that, that we get comments sometimes like, why aren't you talking to people of color? I'm like, well, we do talk to people of color. Um, but, um, but we really thank you for doing this work, it's hard you know, and uh, we, we really appreciate your doing it too, I think, uh, and recognizing that whiteness is something to be deconstructed, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Good night.